Okay, we were looking at, uh, before the break, we were looking at uh, capillarity, and we've seen that three big guys, you know, you might have heard of the, of the, of the Young equation, or the Young Laplace equation, um, defined uh, interfacial and interfacial or surface tension, which was basically because, you know, you had to give up some cohesive interaction between, uh, between molecules if you would place things at an interface, and they, they meet another face which they not like. Because if they like the other face, then they wouldn't face separate and therefore would be fully miscible. So you get a tension between these faces. And the larger the tension, obviously, the more, uh, the more issues you have with this. And, uh, and you can obviously think of mediators that can relieve the tension. For example, a tension between oil and water could be about 50 millinewtons uh, per meter, yeah? And in order to relieve that tension, you might add some surfactant molecules that are amphiphilic with a polar head in the water phase and their aliphatic chain in the oil phase, so they keep the oil phase happy and the other side keeps the water phase happy. So it's like a, a UN mediator on a molecular scale. And, uh, and, they, and they come in and they lower the tension to about four or something. Yeah? But that's not always the case. So and a lot of other things um, are related to this interfacial tension. So for example, the phenomenon of capillary rise. You know, you might have seen that if you would have a small capillary in the lab and you have a drop of water and the capillary is made out of glass and you put the capillary on top of the drop of water, it sucks up the water up to a certain length, yeah? And then uh, you might even wonder, what if I now cut the capillary just like halfway, there's water at the top, will water then squirt out of the top? Yes or no? And is that the reason why uh, rivers exist? Yes or no? So this is like, this is not my um, way of thinking, this is a way of thinking of, uh, of ages and ages and ages ago. Uh, so I'm not gonna say whether it is yes or right or wrong, I want you to think about this and then make up your mind yourself and I'll tell you in the next lecture whether it was right or wrong. But uh, one thing related to this, which is very important for colloidal matter, is something which is called the Laplace pressure. And uh, it's related to curved interfaces. And the Laplace pressure in a way, if you want to describe it, is just if I pass a curved interface, I get a jump in pressure. This jump could be positive or could be negative. Yeah? But there will be a pressure difference if I grow across an interface that is curved. And the definition of Laplace pressure is given in the equation that's typed out. The difference in pressure is the interfacial tension between the two respective phases times 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2. Now the question is, what is 1 over R1 plus 1 over R2? So that's a value for the mean curvature at a specific point on that interface. Um, the easiest way to describe this if you would draw a pair, my crappy representation of a pair, the purple blob, yeah? And then if you would slice it with a knife, so the dotted line, I slice my pair across, and then I can end up with a circular type of, well, an ellipsoidal type of area, flat area, and I can draw an area with a certain radius related to that, yeah? And, uh, and then I tilt 90 degrees, and I come from the other side, and just where I touch it at the point, and I can draw another circle at which I, I touch the point on the surface of my pair at only one particular spot. Now, if my vector of my radius is inside my object that I'm looking at, it is positive, and if it's outside the object, it is negative. So that's roughly the mathematical description of this, uh, of this mean curvature. So this might be a little bit abstract, so let's approach this from a different uh, route, and let's uh, just look at a sphere. 
So let's just look at a small droplet of, uh, of oil dispersed in water. So now I've drawn a droplet of oil, which I've made purple, and uh, of a certain radius. And um, I'm going to wonder, what if I make this droplet of oil a little bit bigger? What would then happen? So, and obviously, if you go back to, uh, to thermodynamics, if you want to make things bigger, so if you want to change the volume, you undertake work. Yeah? So in classical thermo, a change in work, or work basically, was defined as minus PDV. Yeah? This is not the only work you do. So you do this minus PDV, so you've got P0, uh, it's not a zero, it's an O, stands for oil. Yeah? So minus P oil, D volume of oil. Minus P water, D volume of water, is classical work. But on top of that, I have a change in area, so I have to multiply interfacial tension times area, which is also an energetic contribution. Yeah? So not only do my volumes changes, my tension, my total tension surface energy changes as well as a result of that. So I have to multiply, I have to add the interfacial tension between the oil and the water phase with the effective change in area of this oil droplet becoming bigger. So now, the change in volume is basically 4 pi r squared, and then you have to times dr. Yeah, so that's the differential form of the change in volume. Change in area, 8 pi r dr. Yeah? Now, if I make my oil droplet larger, then my water volume shrinks in this case because total volume is preserved in this particular case. Yes, so the change in the expansion in volume of oil basically is minus the change in water. And if you then fill in these numbers in the top equation, you basically end up with delta P is P0, so P, oh, sorry, P oil minus P water, is two times the interfacial tension divided by the radius of the oil droplet. Now, does that make sense with respect to the top equation? So you're at one particular point on the surface of a sphere. Yeah? You have to draw a circle that touches that point. So you basically just draw a circle on the edge of a sphere. It doesn't matter how you draw it, yeah? So that's R. Then you turn it 90 degrees. You have to draw a second circle that goes through that particular point. Again, you have to draw a circle over the sphere in order to accommodate for this. So you basically get interfacial tension, one over R plus one over R is two times interfacial tension over R. So the Laplace pressure difference between the pressure of the oil droplet minus the pressure of the water, which is like the bulk, yeah, is two times the interfacial tension divided by the radius of the droplet. So this effectively means if my droplet becomes smaller and smaller and smaller, that means that my Laplace pressure becomes larger and larger and larger, which means that I can end up with massive pressures inside this droplet of a few hundred megapascal, even if I make my droplets small enough, which have dramatic consequences on shape. Yeah, imagine the droplet is a balloon. So I want to be a sphere, right? Massive pressure. Yeah, and, and also on solubility, we'll come back to that later, which is called a process which is called Oswald ripening. So all other, all other kind of things start to become really important if you look at Laplace pressures on small matter, you can get dramatic overpressures or dramatic underpressures. So capillary rise is the opposite. Yeah, you get an underpressure. That's the reason why you suck the liquid up in the capillary. So the Laplace pressure is negative there. Okay. Now, 
some voting here. There's two statements. And uh, let's do the first one. When we make a droplet of oil and water smaller and smaller in the absence of an external field, so I'm not shaking or anything, right? It becomes a sphere. As this geometry has the lowest area to volume ratio of possible shapes, so the sphere has the lowest area uh, to volume ratio of possible shapes, and hence it will minimize the total surface area. So the other, the other way you can think about it, if you make objects small enough, is there any other way how you could um, make an object of a different shape that has a smaller area to volume ratio, so you basically minimize interfacial energy. So does every object in this particular case, does this droplet always become a sphere? Or for example, can it become a cube or a cylinder or an egg or uh, anything else? So a liquid oil droplet dispersed in water so is A, does it always become a sphere? So then press A and press B if you want to, um, if you think it can uh, have a different shape. Some people are pressing random buttons. They either have massive fingers or spontaneously fell asleep with their face flat on the, on the thing. So I think uh, it's almost unanimous, apart from some background noise, that, uh, that yes, it's true, right? So um, if you make a liquid droplet small enough, it by definition uh, becomes a sphere. Now, okay, so let's take this a little bit further. Therefore, if this is true, it is logical that all nanoparticles will eventually become a sphere. Press A if you think this is true. Press B if you think this is not true. So you could turn the question upside down. Can I make nanoparticles that are not a sphere? So that's about 40, 60. OK. So let's put people out of their misery. Um, OK, so the interesting thing is, Surface energy is not the only factor that contributes to the shape of a particle. It's very important, and therefore objects you know, that can flow or can morph, which basically, in a way, that are kinetically not frozen, that can change shape, they will adopt a spherical conformation. Yeah? So a liquid droplet will, also, will always become a sphere in order to minimize surface tension. However, well, surface energy. However, other factors may play a role. So for example, you could crystallize. Yeah? And as a result of that, a crystal lattice might minimize the energy, and you can end up with a different shape. So in order to convince you that not all particles are spherical, I'll show you some examples. So here you can see that there's a, a large variety of shapes available in colloids. So the uh, picture on the left is a transmission electron micros micrograph. So if you don't know what the difference between scanning electron microscopy is and transmission electron microscopy, scanning means it's like taking a picture. Yeah, You look at the reflective uh, response of the electron beam. And transmission is you zap right through it. So it's comparable to an x-ray. Well. Not exactly, but roughly, right? So, uh, so in that particular, you see um, dip side plates, which are clay platelets. And you can clearly see that they're not spherical. They're a bit disc-like, and they're a bit edgy-like. And um, so they look quite fascinating. And then uh, you can go really extreme. So people like to build extreme stuff. So here you get these multi-pots. They're not exactly tripods. Some of them are tripods. Some of them are a bit distorted tripods or there's one or two tetrapods in there. But these are, uh, you know, cadmium-based nanoparticles and they're clearly not spherical, yeah? So other forces um, can play a role in this. And this, in this particular case, in most cases, it's, uh, it's crystalline or crystallization that uh, determines the factor. However, that is not 
exclusively the only force um, that can play a role. So here you see on the left, you see a tobacco mosaic virus. And uh, this virus is actually a suprastructure. You could call it a supracolloidal structure because it has one strain of, of uh, RNA uh, in the middle. And then in a chimney-like cylindrical fashion, it has 2,130 units of globulary type of proteins assembled around it into a cylindrical object, which you can clearly see on this, uh, on this TEM image. Uh, on the right hand side, you see particles that are triploids. So these are made in our lab. And uh, in the middle, they're hydrophilic and they have hairs. So it's like hairy hydrophilic things. And on the outside, they're smooth and they're hydrophobic. And they're clearly not um, they're clearly not spherical. Um, this is a cryo uh, TEM image. Okay, so then the last kind of introductory uh, definition of colloids before we will start looking a bit more in depth on how to make these things is that there are roughly two classes. There is something which is called uh, well, lyophilic colloids. And these are colloids that are thermodynamically stable. So they disperse spontaneously and they're always indefinitely happy. There is not many of them. There's only a few. So microemulsions, which is a very niche area, contains a lot of surfactant typically, 50%. Very, very, very small droplets. And some microgels. Your contact lens, for example, is a hydrogel. Imagine you shrink your contact lens to below a micron, then that would be uh, a good example of a microgel. Um, most colloids, however, are lyophobic, which basically means that in principle, they're thermodynamically unstable. And this is logical because of interfacial tension. There's always a tension and in order to get rid of all this tension, you just whack them all together into one big macroscopic material, and then you got rid of a lot of interfacial tension. Yeah? So these things always have a tendency to aggregate or to flocculate, and the only thing between you and that from happening is to put a barrier in place to get a metastable. And metastable is dependent on time. So, you know, if you make a a waterborne coating, and you want to have a shelf life stability of two years, it doesn't matter that after 50 years, the stuff destabilizes. With milk, right, there's an expiry date on the bottle. You don't really care that if the bottle is half a year old, that the stuff becomes unstable and you basically end up with one oil face floating on top of, uh, yeah? So most colloids are lyophobic. Only a few of them um, are lyophilic. 